Hi everyone, my name is Edouard Berrocal and I'm going to talk about new ways to image stress. But before starting, I would like to thank the organizing committee of the iClass 2021 for inviting me as a keynote speaker. The picture I'm going to show you now is probably one of the first ever recorded high-speed image series of an atomizing spray. This was done in 1927 by the American scientist Edward Bilsway. In this example, the frame rate was set to 2000 frames per second, and the liquid fuel was injected at 550 bar within a surrounding air pressurized at 14 bar. Those operating conditions were really challenging, and one may be curious to know how could it be possible to generate such image series nearly 100 years ago. I actually have a picture of the experimental setup. And we can see here a series of condensers, 25 of them, and each condenser was charged up to 30,000 volts. Then a motor located here was used to rotate a plate and switch on each of those condensers within a very short time. When a condenser was discharging, a spark, an electric spark, was created in this ball reflecting light towards the spray. Then another motor located here was used to rotate very rapidly the photographic film on which the images were exposed. This was probably, without any doubt, I would say, the most advanced laboratory for spray characterization. And it was located in this building, the main building of the NSEA, standing for the National Advisory Committee for Aeronautics. Today, this corresponds to NASA. And the point I try to make here is that one of the first experiments done at the early birth of NASA was focusing on the study of atomizing sprays for propulsion. So it just shows the importance of this topic. Today, I will show you a panoply of new techniques based on recent laser system and cameras, allowing better visualization of atomizing sprays. Atomizing sprays can be described in the following way. First of all, we have two regions, the spray formation region near the nozzle and the spray region further down. In the spray formation region, one may observe a liquid core. Primary breakups are occurring, resulting to the formation of large liquid bodies and ligaments. And then those large liquid structures will break up a second time. And this will result into the formation of smaller droplets, which will be spherical and will be transported and evaporate in the spray region. Now, depending on the operating condition, some sprays may be more challenging to image than others. And to assess how difficult is a spray for imaging, one can simply illuminate it with a laser beam. In this case, the incident light intensity will be exponentially reduced as a function of the distance L, as well as as a function of the number density N of droplets and the extinction cross-section. The extinction cross-section is related to the size of the droplets. And the larger the droplets, the larger will this cross-section B. If now we look at this product, we actually call it the optical depth. And the optical depth has a very important meaning because it corresponds to the average number of scattering events along L. The larger is the optical depth and the more interaction between photons and droplets occurs meaning the more difficult it will be to image such a spray. So for example, if we have an optical less, less than two, 
as shown here. And I put my fingers beyond the spread. We can clearly see my fingers. So there is high visibility in this situation. If now I increase the pressure of injection, the optical depth will increase and my fingers become less visible in this situation. And if, if I keep increasing the pressure of injection, now my fingers are not visible at all. And this is a situation where the optical depth is larger than six. So in average, we have more than six capturing events for a laser beam crossing the spread. So we can see this transition between visibility and no visibility as a function of how high is the optical depth. In this presentation, I will talk about high speed imaging in 3D. Then I'm talking, I will talk about how can we do ultra high speed shadow graphics. After that, I will explain the suppression of multiple scattering and how we can do droplet sizing in the spray gem. Finally, I will talk about high contrast imaging of the spray formation region in optically dense spray, as well as X-ray tomography for 3D reconstruction of liquid volume. Spray systems contain numerous liquid bodies of different shape and size, such as ligaments and liquid sheets. What can be very relevant is to extract in 3D the surface deformation of such structure. And especially if this is done at high speed. For example, one could study the growth of instabilities that is responsible for liquid breakup. In this presentation, I am going to show you a technique capable of doing this. This technique is called FPV, standing for French Projection Laser Induced Fluorescence. But let's go to the lab and record some data. Here we have a holocone water spray injected using a pressure swirl atomizer. The spray is illuminated using a CW laser at 450 nanometer, meaning in the blue region. However, the spray is appearing green because we have mixed the injected liquid with a dye, fluorescein. And fluorescein emits in the green region when being excited. To now record images of such a large spray, we're using a shine flu imaging configuration, where the objective here is tilted in comparison to the axis of the camera. In front of the objective, we're using a fluorescence bandpass filter in order to collect only the light from the fluorescence and reject the excitation blue light from the laser. So those are the images being recorded using such configuration. And we can see here that this is different than shadow graphy. In this situation, the liquid is emitting light and the background is dark. If we now look at the operating condition, in the top left corner, we can see that we are running at 20,000 frames per second. And in this situation, we had an image of 1,024 times 1,024 pixels. So in this situation, the spray was illuminated homogeneously. And there is no, it's very difficult to extract the 3D surface from a simple 2D image. So now what we are doing, what we are going to do is to create a structure, some fringes, vertical fringes. So instead of an homogeneous beam, we'll have those line structures that will illuminate the spray. And what is the advantage of that? The advantage is we can 
analyze how those lines will be deformed as a function of liquid surface. So what I'm going to do now is to introduce a diffractive optic elements on the path of the laser beam. I'm sliding it right now. And by doing so, we'll be able to create those fringes. Not that one can actually use also a grating. So if now we look at the images, we can clearly see how we do have those line patterns on the spray. And we are going to analyze the deformation of those lines in order to obtain the third dimension. So this is a cartoon of the experimental setup. We can see here we are projecting vertical line until the, it's reaching the holocon spray here. And down here we have the recorded image. And what we are going to compare is how those lines have been modified in comparison to the incident profile. And this can be done by actually recording a reference by putting a cuvette with a flat surface and recording an image of this reference. Here, along this line, we have the blue line. We can see the modulation, and that is going to be our reference. And if we compare the phase of this modulation with the phase of what has been recorded up there, we can look at it in 1D here, the green line, we can see it has been some changes. But interestingly, those changes indicated by each of those arrows can be related to the depths of the liquid sheet. So by calibrating properly, we can now, and extracting those phase shift pixel by pixel, we can now find out an estimation of a 3D structure of the surface. And this is what we can obtain. So on the left, on your left, this is a recorded data, and this is the 3D reconstruction of the liquid sheet. So if you are interested to know more about this technique, you can read this article, or you can listen alternatively to Adrian Rose, who will present his iClass paper on this topic. In my previous section, I was talking about 3D reconstruction. Here, I'm going to talk about speed. In some situations, atomizing sprays consist of liquid jets being injected at high liquid pressure, reaching velocities of 100 meter per second. Analyzing such jets require a lot on the imaging system, especially very high frame rate and short exposure time. Such cameras exist, recording at megahertz frame rate, but they are really expensive and not affordable to everyone. In this section, I'm going to talk about an approach, allowing to capture a series of a few images at similar frame rate, using inexpensive optical components such as LEDs and standard CMOS camera. The approach is called FRAME, standing for Frequency Recognition Algorithm for multiple exposure. Let me explain the principle of the technique. If we have a sample here that is uniformly illuminated, we can assume that the intensity is a constant. And the recorded image shown here in the special domain can be analyzed in the Fourier domain here. The high frequencies of the image, meaning the details of the image, will be a little bit offside from the center, while the global information of the same image will be close to the center. If now we are illuminating the same sample, but with an intensity modulated illumination, something very interesting is happening here. 
we can see that the information of the sample that is still in the center is duplicated. And this is duplicated at a given frequency. This frequency corresponds to the distance between here and here, correspond to the frequency of the modulated illumination. So we are duplicating the information and we can see that this is done following the symmetry of the Fourier domain. If now we are changing the orientation of the modulation, what we can observe is that the information will be stored in another place in the Fourier domain. If now we consider those two modulations together, then we are duplicating twice the information of the sample. And if we do that four times, we are duplicating four times. So what we are doing is we are creating in, we are using the Fourier domain in order to allocate information from the sample. In this example, the sample is static. So one may wonder why doing this. But just imagine is now the sample is changing form very rapidly, like a spray. Then the information stored at different place will be different. So what we need to do now is to create this uncoded light, but we need to illuminate the sample at, with light pulses, with pulse train that will come one after another onto the sample. The experimental setup allowing to do that is shown here. And it's quite simple to explain. It consists of four channels, one, two, three, and four. As all of those channels are identical, I will just explain one of them. So we have an LED here that will illuminate a diffuser. In front of the diffuser, we'll have a grating of a fixed frequency and orientation. And this will decide where we will allocate the information in the Fourier domain. Then light is recombined and will exit here. We have an objective that will form an image of those grating exactly where the spray is located. And if those LEDs are illuminated one after another in a very short time, we are creating this pulse train shown here. And those will come all together into the sensor of the camera. The resulting image looks like that. So we can see, we can get from this image that it has been illuminated multiple times. The first illumination is, is here, second probably down there, the third corresponds to the spray moving here, and the fourth here. And if we zoom in, we can actually see the encoding of the light. It's difficult to see because first of all, all those illumination are superimposed with different orientation. And second, we have tried to encode at as high frequency as possible. The higher the frequency, the further away from the center, we are translating the information in the Fourier domain. So if we do a fast Fourier transform of this image, we are obtaining this. And we can see the information of the first pulse, the second, the third, and the fourth here. Now remember, each of those pearls have been coming into the sample at different time. So what we want to do now is to extract the information of each of them and decode the image. And to do that, we are, doing, we are going to do a lock-in analysis where this information will be translated to the center and we can after apply a Gaussian or Butterworth filter. 
By doing so, on the post-processing, we're obtaining this image, which is decoded. If we repeat the process for the second, the third, and the fourth illumination, we are creating those four images. So the point I want to make here is speed here is not due to the camera itself, but it's due to the illumination and by encoding light. And by now fixing those pulses more or less close from each other, we can have different frame rates. This is what we have done here. We can have a delta T of 100 microseconds, such as the example just shown previously, or 50 microseconds, five, and we can go down to 0.25 microseconds. This was the limit of this instrument. However, if you are replacing the LEDs with such a laser, that produce nanoseconds pulse tunable between 5 to 40 nanoseconds. We can even boost those capabilities by still having an instrument that remains fairly compact. So the future of frame for ultra-fast shadowgraphy of sprays seems very promising. If you want to know more about it, I would suggest to read this article and I would like to thank my coaches for their work in developing Frame. In this section, I'm going to talk about multiple light scattering suppression in order to be able to size spherical droplets located in the spray region. And to do this, we are going to use a technique called SLEEPY standing from Structured Laser Illumination Planar Imaging. We have here a picture of a light sheet illuminating a spray. And if we want to apply Sleepy, we'll have to illuminate this way. At first, those two illumination looks really similar. But if we zoom in, we can actually see a structure along the vertical direction. So the light intensity is modulated in space, very similar to what I've been presenting in the two previous sections. However, here we'll take advantage of this signature in order to remove multiple light scattering. If we compare this illumination to here, we can see that in this case, it's really homogeneous. And the idea is that photons that have been scattered multiple times will have short memories. They will be out of focus. So they will not preserve this modulation. So what we need to do now is to extract the amplitude of the modulation that will correspond to the single light scattering and to suppress the non-modulated component. So here is the first image recorded and we can see that we have a phase, an initial phase, and we have a modulation shown here along 1D in the vertical direction. If now we want to extract the amplitude of the modulation, as I was talking about, and reject the non-modulated component, we will need to record three images, where the phase is shifted 100 degrees, a third of a period between each recording. So what we have done here, we have displaced those line structure a third of a period. If now we sum up those three images, we have this result. And there is no real improvement. However, if we sum up the absolute value of the differences between each pairwise image, we will obtain this result. And we can see the differences between the two. In this situation, any intensities that are similar between each images will be suppressed by the subtraction. 
but any differences will be preserved. So this is why we are suppressing the non-modulated component. This example was done in 2008. It was one of the first sleepy image ever recorded. Nowadays, we are capable of doing the same, but live, especially if we have a steady spread. And we can compare directly the differences between the two. So let's have a look to such a result. Here on the right, we have Sleepy, and on the left, we have the conventional light sheet. We have fixed a syringes in front of the spread, and this is not visible on the Sleepy. But if we put this syringe behind the spread, now we fully see the spread on the Sleepy imaging configuration, while the conventional light sheet still show the presence of the syringe located behind, which is out of focus. If now we increase the pressure of injection, we are inducing more and more multiple light scattering. And this is clearly visible on the left, while on the right, the image remains very clear. If now we move the light sheet in front of the spray, we can see this boomerang shape. And if we keep moving the light sheet in front, this move boomerang shape will be less and less high. This is correspond to the section between the holocone spray and the illuminated plane. When we are displacing the light sheet, we can see line structures appearing. This is because in between the three recordings, the spray must be steady. So this is here the experimental setup, allowing to create this modulated or structured light sheet. We have a CW laser beam here that is expanded. Then we're illuminating a grating located here. This grating is, can be displaced vertically in order to change the phase of the modulation. Then we have a cylindrical lens that will create an image of the grating into the spray. And we have another cylindrical lens that will focus the beam into a light sheet. We record the data using a camera at 90 degrees, located here. If now we want to do droplet sizing, one may need to detect two signals. A leaf signal, this one camera here, and a miss signal. Another configuration could be to do the measurement sequentially by moving interference filter in front of a single camera. And this situation can be valid if the spray is steady and you have statistical and is statistical constant. So we, you always collect the same amount of light. The advantage of this configuration is that the two images will be exactly will collect light exactly the same way. And you can use a telecentric lens, shown here, which has the advantage of collecting light with the same angle for each pixel. So a calibration in one location of the image will be valid on the full image. So for quantitative measurement, telecentric lens are really important, and one may consider to use, to use it. So the LIF signal will be related to the sum of the volume of the droplet. But if, the, if sleepy is not applied, one will collect also some multiple light scattering, as indicated here. Now the miss signal will be related to the sum up of the surface area of the droplet. And once again, if sleepy is not applied, then 
a multiple captured signal will also be detected. By now applying Sleepy, we can suppress those contributions and we can create a ratio between those two signals. And this is proportional to the SMD. Here are some examples of leaf me ratio using Sleepy. And this is using the three phases. So we are preserving here the spatial resolution. But if you remember in my previous section on frame, it's also possible to extract the amplitude of the modulation using only one image by applying a lock-in analysis. And by doing so, we can do, we can have a result with only one structured image. And we'll obtain this. So there are some differences. But in some situations, one will be very satisfied with such a result. And it will be much easier to do a scanning, a 3D scanning of the size in the spray. So now we need to calibrate those ratios. And this can be done using phase Doppler anemometry, using, for example, the PDI TK2 instrument. So we can extract the SMD using the PDI and the corresponding leaf me ratio. And this is done at different height in the spray to have better statistics when it comes to extract a calibration curve. Using this calibration curve and the previous ratio I was showing before, we can now obtain the SMD. By now scanning the spray, the SMD is obtained at different location. If this is done with a very small displacement, it's actually possible to reconstruct in 3D the SMD within the spray region. If you want to know more about Sleepy with one face and droplet sizing, I would recommend to read those two articles. In my previous section, I was showing how multiple capturing can be suppressed using Sleepy. And this was applied for averaged images in the spray region, where spherical droplets were already formed. When it comes to image, the spray formation region near the nozzle, we need to have high resolution and single shot images. And in this case, Sleepy may not be the right option. I am showing you in this section an alternative solution called two photon LIF, able to provide high contrast images. Let me demonstrate the capability of the technique. Here we have a six hole GDI injector, and the liquid is injected at 200 bar. We can, the plume on the back are obscuring light and it's very hard to observe in clear detail the structures of the liquids in such a spray. If now we use a planar, a laser sheet illumination and we record the image with the exact same camera, we will obtain this image. So if we compare we can still see that the contribution of the other plume is, are still, is still there because of multiple light scattering while we are illuminating this plume. Once again, it's becoming very hard to observe individual liquid structures. However, if now we will detect a two photon LIF signal, we will obtain this image. And if we compare the two, we can clearly see that the plumes on the back of the sprays are not there anymore. Multiple light scattering is not contributing to the image and the liquid structures are clearly visible. Large liquid bodies, 
small droplets as well as instabilities can be observed and, and analyzed from these high contrast images. But how is that working? Why we don't have multiple lights capturing blurring the image in such situation? Let me explain how this works. In the situation of one photon laser induced fluorescence, in order to excite electrons from atoms and molecules, what is needed is that the incoming photons must be of energy corresponding to the energy difference between the ground state down here to the excited state. Then the electrons will lose energy due to vibrational relaxation. And when it will go down to the ground state, a fluorescent signal will be emitted. And this will be at a lower energy than the incoming photon, meaning that if we excite in the blue, for the case of fluorescein, a green signal will be emitted. So what's now, what's happening for two photons? It's exactly the same principle. However, what we need is two photons of half the energy arriving exactly at the same time to excite the electron. And for this to happen, what we need is femtoseconds laser pulses. So we need a very short light pulse so that the probability that two photons arrive at the same time and excite the electron is high. And thanks to modern lasers, femtoseconds laser of high pulse energy, we do generate such light at 800 nanometer and around 25 femtoseconds. All right. What's happening now if we are illuminating a spray? Here is a case where we illuminate the spray with a blue laser. So first of, first of all, we can observe that we'll have some single mist scattering. Some of photons will just exit the spray. Then some photons will scatter multiple times. This is multiple light scattering. When it comes to fluorescence, in some situation, we'll have photons that will fluoresce and exit directly. In other cases, we'll have fluorescence that will be scattered after multiple times. Another scenario will be that the fluorescence will be generated outside of the light sheet here. And another one is that the fluorescence is generated from these multiply scattered photons and will also be multiply scattered. So there are many scenarios possible. The last one will be a fluorescence generated outside of the focal of the laser beam here. So all those scenarios are shown now. What's happening if we replace this illumination with a very short pulse of light? Then we can observe that there are three cases where fluorescence is not generated. This is where the where we are outside of the focus here. It's where light, the scattered light outside, is not generating fluorescence here, and the multiply scattered light neither. So if I get back, you can see the differences. And those three contributions here will blur the image. And why is that happening? The reason is, to generate fluorescence, we need two photons arriving at the same place at the same time, and we need this at high probability. If photons are scattered, then the time delay between each of them is increased, and this probability will reduce. So outside of the focus of the light sheet, the probability will be highly reduced. So when the beam is diverging, we are not anymore generating two photons. When photons are scattered away, we are not anymore generating two photons. 
So two scenarios remain if we remove the scatter line. It's the single photons fluorescent, the signal we really want on the way out, and then some of them will still experience some multiple light scattering on the way out. But those are the only two scenarios, and this will really help in boosting the image contrast. This is experimental setup, and it's very simple. The only thing you need is a laser. If you can afford such a laser, providing very short pulse and high pulse energy, around a few millijoules, then you're pretty set. The only thing that you need on the experimental setup is to form a light sheet with a cylindrical lens, and you're ready to go. You need to inject a dye, so your fuel needs to be mixed with a dye, in this case it's fluorescein, and you will use a bandpass filter in front of the camera. And this is the type of result you can now obtain. You can look at many injection series and analyze the spray statistically. So this is really promising. It's a quite new approach and there is a lot to do using 2PLI. If you are interested to know more about it, I would recommend to read this article. In my previous section, I was talking about optical techniques. Here, I'm going to talk about X-ray in order to extract the liquid mass within the spray formation region of highly atomizing sprays. The novelty of this section is that the X-ray beam used here is not generated from a synchrotron, but using a laser plasma accelerator. So let me explain how this is working. We have on the right a picture of such a device and on the left a cartoon showing a laser plasma accelerator. And the main idea is to focus a laser pulse, which is extremely short, in this case 38 femtoseconds, and very intense. We have here 800 millijoule pulse energy. And once this pulse is focusing within a gas jet, consisting here of 99% helium and 1% nitrogen, an X-ray beam will be created. To understand this process, we need to zoom in at the focus of the beam. And what's happening is that the laser pulse here will ionize the medium. So electrons will be pushed away on the side. This will create a plasma wave. And on the right condition, involving the dimension of the pulse itself, a cavity may be created behind the pulse. And if a cavity is created here, high electric fields will be there as well. Meaning that when an electron will leak into this area, it will be subjected, subjected to those electric fields and they, they will oscillate and accelerate. And due to this process of acceleration, X -ray, an X-ray pulse will be generated. This X-ray pulse will follow exactly the same path than the laser beam. So we, what we have now is to separate the two. So we're using an aluminum foil that will block the laser pulse and let through the X-ray beam. And then we have a captain window here as well to cross, to keep all of this into a vacuum. In a similar way, electrons need to be deflected. And this is done by means of magnets here. Once the X-ray pulse is exiting, we just have to put the spray in front of it and an X-ray camera. And we will do some X-ray absorption in 2D. In order to look at the specification, of a laser plasma accelerator, we can have a look at this table and compare 
with what we can obtain from a synchrotron, for example, from the Argonne National Laboratory. And one of the main advantage of using a laser plasma accelerator is that a large beam here, 20 millimeter, not that the beam is diverging. So depending on the distance, you may have different size is used. While in a synchrotron, tiny beam are usually produced uh, up to four millimeter. A second advantage is that the energy used is in the range of one to 10 kilo electron volt for a laser plasma accelerator. And this corresponds to the soft X-ray region. It means that a fewer amount of liquid will absorb more the X-ray beam. While for a synchrotron under a monochromatic configuration, we can have an energy ranging between 5 and 15 kilo electron volt. So in this case, to have an equal absorption, more additives may be required. So what we can also observe that is the downside of a laser plasma accelerator is that one pulse is generated every 10 seconds. So we cannot do any high repetition rate imaging, which is possible using an extra beam from a synchrotron. Here we can reach 120 kilowatts. So we have pros and cons, but what can be said here is that the fact that we can have a large beam, this is very beneficial when it comes to 3D reconstruction, which is what we are aiming at doing here. So this is a type of image we can obtain for a single shot image. And each pixel is around 11 microns resolution. If now we average 25 images, we will obtain such image here. So what we need to do now is to calibrate the equivalent pass length to put some number and find out how much pass of liquid has been crossed by the X-ray. And to know that, one need to deduce the um, spectra of the X-ray at the detector. And to deduce that, we need to know what was at the source. And once the X-ray beam has crossed the aluminum foil, the captain window, the barium plate in front of the camera, as well as the traveling in the air, the spectra will be shifted into slightly higher energy photon. So we will have an average of in our a maximum of 5.5 kilo electrovolt while at the source it was 2.3. Once we know this spectrum and we can deduce the calibration curve. And if we want to in increase the absorption, we can add potassium iodide. The blue curve is for 20% potassium iodide, while the red curve is for pure water. So depending on how much liquid is in your spray, you may have to include the right concentration of potassium iodide to increase the sensitivity of your measurement. But remember, depending on the concentration of potassium iodide, you will change the um, surface tension and viscosity of your liquid. So this is something you need to double check. So if we get back to our average image, and now we applied this calibration curve, we will obtain this result. And we can see an equivalent pass length close to 200 microns near the nozzle then down to 75 microns here, and in the spray region down to 25 microns. If now we rotate this nozzle very cautiously at different angles, and we calibrate, we have those images calibrated, then we can take this set of data 
and do a 3D tomographic reconstruction, which is what we have done here. So we can figure out the liquid volume fraction in 3D from very near to the nozzle and further down. If you are interested in knowing more about the use of laser plasma accelerator for X-ray absorption, I will recommend to read this article. So in conclusion, I have been showing you in this presentation three optical techniques based on structured illumination. One technique, FP leaf, for 3D reconstructions of liquid surfaces. Another one, prime, for ultra-fast shadowgraphy. And a third one, sleepy, to suppress multiple light scattering in the spray region in order to size droplets. Then I've been showing you two extra techniques, one called 2PLIF for two photons laser and use fluorescence, allowing high contrast images of the spray formation region. And the last one was X-ray tomography for 3D reconstruction of liquid mass. Not that those two last techniques rely on the use of high energy ultra short laser pulses and if one can afford a laser plasma accelerator or have access to such a device those two techniques can actually be combined and measurement can be done simultaneously so using the advantage of visible light as well as x-ray together one can better understand the process of liquid atomization. With that, I would like to thank all my co-workers who have been involved one way or the other into this work. I would like to thank also the European Research Council as well as the Swedish Research Council for their financial support. But most importantly, I would like to thank you for your attention.